Here we go. Yeah, awesome. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for uh, the traffic online meetup today. I'm super happy to see you. My name is Patricia Dugan, and I am the head of community at Traffic, and I lead our marketing um, and lead and design our marketing initiatives to help uh, represent the community and give you what you what you need to um, build and and best learn about what Traffic offers the world. So uh, today we have um, Tron Hindenis, who is the SRE lead at uh, at um, Rick's TV. And the way this is going to go today is um, we, we start these um, educational webinars with an introduction by me, and then we pass it off to the person who will be speaking about the ways that traffic is helping their business um, solve interesting technical challenges. And during these, uh, during these meetups, what you can do is enter your questions in the chat box, and then we'll answer them at the end. Um, if you're not able to stay for the whole session, I, I encourage you please to email me or ping me in the chat box so that I can make sure that you know about upcoming uh, meetups that we'll have. Also, um, there's just some special things I'd like to engage with you on. And then also, if you are using traffic in some ways you think would be great to show the world through a meetup, please ping me as well. Um, so, if we don't get to your questions during this session today, what we're going to do is we're going to, the best of our ability, address the questions that you've asked um, via a GitHub gist, which we will share post event. Um, so let's see, what else? I'd like for you to really enjoy yourself today. Please utilize the chat box. Um, please know that we're going to hand this off to Tron. He's gonna show us some really cool demos about how he's using traffic to help uh, traditional micro traditional workloads as well as Kubernetes workloads um, and in making uh, Rick's TV a super awesome company with their technology and so we're so excited to hear what he's going to say um, and so I'm going to pass this off to you Trond and and listen eagerly with our uh, the people who have joined us and thanks for joining us everyone Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. And thanks to uh, Patricia and Traffic for, for inviting me to speak. Certainly happy to share uh, some, of, some of what we've done with, with Traffic um, during, uh, during the course of the last couple of, couple of years. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just get right to it, I guess. I, I don't expect anyone to, to really have heard of Riksdab. It's a Norwegian company. We, we have only our market is basically Norway. So if you're outside of Norway, there's a good chance you've never heard of us. But what we are is basically uh, basically a broadcast dis distribution company. So we offer both kind of traditional TV broadcast services as well as kind of more modern on-demand streaming services. So we sell from, for example, HBO and Paramount and, and yeah. Uh, and 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 kind of the situation we are in right now is that is that as our kind of customers transition from like traditional viewing habits over to more uh, uh, more kind of online streaming type habits is that places um, places a new kind of load or some new challenges on on our system. So we've we've been in a situation where we kind of have had to kind of ramp up the way we the way we scale and automate our systems um, during the during the last couple of years. And I, I won't go into like too much details about these, these graphs that you're seeing, but but essentially the top left is just some screenshots from our apps and services. The top right is actually some graph showing that we actually serve, I think it's close to like 10 million image downloads per day, which kind of fills our apps. And that's not that's not much if you're Google, but it's kind of much if you're a small Norwegian broadcast company like ourselves. So that, that's basically our, our kind of situation. And, and um, traditionally, uh, Rista was our kind of main platform to develop on was, was Windows and .NET. And, and that might maybe surprise some of you because you don't hear too much about Windows and, and .NET these days. But that's, that's kind of our, our kind of main stack. And instead of Instead of fighting that, when we when we started this push to kind of move into the cloud and kind of modernize, we we decided to embrace it and just 
see how we could build, uh, excuse the term, kick ass automation around it instead of kind of fighting it. So that, that's essentially where we, where we are. Um, we have been kind of running our, our services from a kind of traditional hosting company, but, but we are in the process of kind of moving everything we can to Amazon now to just to get more scalability and kind of use all the automation and, and knobs and dials that Amazon make available for us. Um, and also we've, we've, we are kind of in the process of embracing Kubernetes. So, so right now we have this mix of, of what I call traditional VM based services and Kubernetes based services. And, and, and those services that still run on, on VMs are, are a good bunch of them are, are actually Windows machines. Um, so so what, what we kind of needed to, to come up with was this kind of design for how, how can we support both newer container-based workloads as, as well as not kind of forgetting about our, our kind of main code estate, which, which is like I said, on, on .NET and Windows. Um, so, so we decided to, to kind of make traffic our, our core piece of our infrastructure, both for the, for the VM-based workloads and, and also for, for the things we're, we're running inside of Kubernetes. Uh, and and that's, that's a decision we, we've kind of made from, from day one and, and stuck with it. It's been, it's been working really well for us. Um, so what I thought I'd do was maybe to start off in the kind of not Kubernetes space and, and talk a little bit about how, how we use traffic for, for these traditional kind of workloads that are still hosted on VMs and, and kind of have a different life cycle than, than a typical container-based workload. Uh, so as I said, we, we, uh, we run on, on Amazon. Uh, we migrate everything to Amazon. So, so how we've set up this is that we use Amazon application load balancer. That's kind of our edge load balancer. So, so when a customer uh, opens their mobile app and an call, API calls start kind of flowing into our services, that, that's kind of what they hit. And, and we actually use SSL termination in, in Amazon load balancers. So, so they it's kind of handled by, by the Amazon platform. And then from there, uh, we have this layer, which we, which we call the kind of inner load balancer layer, which is made up of traffic nodes. And that's just traffic running on regular Linux VMs that, that's not container-based at all. And then from there, uh, traffic kind of flows into the back end and, and to the kind of correct API server or web server to kind of ha handle that request. So in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of how it's, how it's laid out. Um, and kind of what ties this together is, is another service uh, called Consul, uh, which is made by the awesome people at HashiCorp. And, and Consul is essentially a, a service discovery uh, system. So you, what you do is you essentially install a node or an agent on, on each of your node. Uh, and then you can do things like health checking and discover other services uh, offered by other nodes or you can ask for, hey, which other nodes are offering the same service as me? And then, and then uh, all of this kind of is what traffic uses to, to decide where to route traffic that, that kind of comes in. I realize now that talking about traffic as in requests coming in and traffic, the, the product is, is kind of confusing, but um, I'll try and emphasize which one I'm talking about if it's unclear. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's that's what we've done, and like I said, we uh, all the SSL termination happens at at the ALB, so we don't have to worry about that uh, further in. And and there's a couple of of reasons for that, but um, but uh, when we have some kind of limitations that kind of limits our use of of traffic's internal kind of let's encrypt integration as well, but that's certainly there and something that you should definitely check out if if you have the option to use it. Um, these nodes that kind of run the traffic node balancer are, are all defined in CloudFormation, which is this language that you use in, in describing uh, AWS resources. And that enables us to scale up and down really, really fast. So if we, if we need more capacity in kind of the network routing layer, we can scale up in a matter of minutes. We haven't had to though, because traffic, the load balancer runs exceptionally light, so, so it can handle quite an impressive amount of load on, on very small VMs. So, so far, we actually haven't had to kind of scale up to, to increase the capacity of our, of our kind of routing layer. So that's good. And then um, 
we also have kind of this health checking system that, that sits that's part of the part of the Amazon uh, load balancer. So they actually ping our traffic nodes to make sure that everything is up. So if something falls down, we can really quickly kind of reroute traffic to another healthy node so that customers most of the time won't won't realize it at all. Um, and then again, we use console to kind of uh, route traffic to to the correct nodes and that also kind of we some tagging that I'll show in a little bit kind of how we separate between internal and external traffic and all of those nitty-gritty details that that just have to be taken care of yeah um, so and we obviously we've we've had a few incidents and, and close calls at Riksdava based on traffic or related to traffic um, and and from we have some learnings from there that I was that I was thinking it would be a good idea to to share with you as well. And 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 one and and it's really important is to kind of really design the the shut shut down and the drain process. You have that like a dynamic infrastructure. You it's it's easy to just focus on on the kind of the scale up and what happens when you add new capacity. But it's equally super important to kind of design the process of of deprovisioning. So what happens when when a node goes away and that you kind of handle that in a graceful manner so that your user kind of won't, won't see that you're actually reducing, reducing capacity. Um, we also had some issues early on related to console, but now in newer versions of traffic, you can set this stale flag uh, in the console integration. And what that does is that it allows the kind of the, the traffic load, the load balancers view of the world to be a little bit out of date which, which kind of makes it a, a lot more tolerant to like changes in your in your service discovery mesh uh, and i'll show that in the config file in a minute as well so very very recommended to have that on and the last one we've we've seen is actually as always in linux you have to watch for open file descriptors and and just make sure that you that you have enough of them that you don't run out uh, so yeah, that's that's I guess three three learnings we've done where we've had kind of close calls with traffic, but obviously none of these are are kind of traffic the load balancers' fault. It's it's just up to us to kind of design design stuff correctly. Um, we at Rikstev are absolutely obsessed with with logging. We love to log everything, and the more logs we we can get our hands on, the the happier we are. Um, and and actually that's that's maybe the the most recent kind of major change we've done to our infrastructure is that before we used to install this logging agent called called filebeats on every single application and api server in our estate but what we saw is that now the traffic is is kind of handled by by the traffic load balancer it actually has a really good logging interface that's super easy to work with so, uh, so the plan is is basically to just stop logging so much out on each on each uh, VM because we we get the same kind of rich information from from the load balancer itself, and that will kind of simplify our our VM provisioning process quite a bit as well. So that's that's nice. Um, so yeah, this is just a. Uh, screenshot of I didn't want to show you our full Kibana thing because there's a lot of data there but it's uh, just an example of how easy it is to kind of uh, create these these log filters and stuff to kind of really uh, use the use the logging data that comes from the traffic load balancer so that's that's been really awesome uh, and here's another example of, of kind of what we see. And as you can see, like bottom right, we, we actually log the kind of backend and front end names, which is this internal traffic construct, but we can use that to kind of determine how traffic gets routed through our infrastructure. Um, so that's super duper awesome. Um, and yeah, so so how kind of, I, I always think it's important, it's interesting to, to Kind of figure out what what the dev responsibilities or kind of how developers kind of interface with with this with this in infrastructure that we'll build that we're building and and at Riksdev we we for devs it, it we kind of have it as a goal to that it should be as easy as possible to 
to work with this and, and we tried to kind of hide away the nitty gritty details of, of this complex infrastructure. So what devs have to kind of add in their APIs and their services that they write is this little snippet, which is uh, basically a service definition that, that's used by the console um, service discovery system. Uh, and, and using that, they actually control kind of the host names that, that should be kind of connected to the service and how much percentage of the traffic should go to canaries versus kind of the main deployment and all of that. So that's kind of fully up to the developers themselves. And, and then we just have this deploy system that kind of translates that into actual infrastructure and, and things just roll out. Um, and also it's important, and this is something we stress with developers all the time, that the better kind of health endpoint they write to their apps, the, the easier it is for us to kind of determine whether or not we should, we should send requests to a node. So that's another super important dev responsibility. Uh, so yeah, and yeah, that's just an example of that console file that they kind of have to add to their app and that kind of, yeah, gets injected during deploy. So that works really, really well. And I think it's important to have these clean interfaces between developer teams and kind of the infrastructure. It just makes life easier. Um, yeah, and again, as you can see, we have this, this is kind of where devs set up the, the config that gets injected into traffic. Uh, and this example is just showing how we, this is basically a canary and kind of the main part of a service where, where some developer has decided that the canary should get a certain percentage of the traffic and so forth. So all of that's just nice and easily handled, not something that we kind of as a cloud infrastructure team has to have to kind of actively uh, manage. That's, that's all done by the devs themselves as it, as it should be. And, and it's, it's really nice to have the traffic load balancer kind of just enable all of that for us in a super simple way. So that's, that's really good. Uh, yeah, some config details. I, I thought it'd be fun to, or fun, uh, maybe at least worth your while to just show some of the configs that we've kind of come up with. Uh, so hopefully you can see this all right. I've zoomed in a little bit and maybe if, if, if some of you are on a super small, small screen, it might not be readable, but hopefully for most of it, for most of you it is. Um, but this is just a, the config file we, we use for, for our kind of VM based traffic load balancers. And there's just a few things I wanted to point out here is kind of the, the integration with, with console. And as you can see, we set this stale equals true, which allows the traffic load balancer to kind of have a slightly out of date view of, of the console database. Not super out of date. I think it's like a second or two at most. So it's, it's totally fine, but it kind of makes the whole system a little bit more resilient to, to transient failures. So we have had, uh, yeah, we have, we've had success with, with enabling that. Uh, and the other part I've talked about is this kind of, how does the system work when you scale down, when you terminate an instance? So the way we've set up is that when we kind of, or when we shut down a traffic load balancer, it's just, it, it would actually sit and for 30 seconds and kind of drain traffic. And that's also reflected in kind of the service file. You can see here, we have this timeout. And that allows kind of the load, the Amazon load balancer to, to kind of drain its requests to the instance that is being terminated so that we don't kind of miss a single incoming request from, from a customer. Uh, so that's super important to just test and get right so that you can trust that also deprovisioning uh, works as, as intended. Uh, so yeah. And then, yeah, I, first demo, awesome. Um, so this demo is, is uh, again, we're still not in Kubernetes land. So I, I thought it'd be fun to just show like how fast uh, console and the traffic load balancer kind of picks up that there is a node failure. So if everything works now, we'll, we'll see if this, if we can get this right. Uh, so what I have now is, if I do that, then we should have, a, ooh, that's really small. Uh, so we actually have this little internal service that we wrote ourselves that basically just enumerates all of our traffic load balancer instances and kind of gives us this view. Uh, 
and I'm sure in time the graphic enterprise product will be a much better choice instead of writing this yourself. But for now, that, that's what we have. And as you can see here, uh, I've scaled up this fake service to two nodes. So these are actually two kind of Windows boxes running, running this service. And then uh, if I click here, I get taken just into the... So this is the kind of dashboard of the traffic load balancer itself. And as you can see, it's kind of, it's connected to, to console and it's decided that, hey, these are two instances. So every request that comes in here gets kind of load balanced between these two backends. So what I thought I'd show was what, what happens when, when one of them fails. So let's see if we can, if we can make that fail. So if I do, let's see is right hopefully it's not too small for you guys uh and then the demo is the vm failure demo yes okay so what we need to do here is i'll just log on to that instance first and then uh you might have heard of iis resets so basically this command just shuts down the application or the web server on that node and, and since console is kind of constantly health checking that node, it gets picked up quite easily. So that's me clicking. Uh, so now it's shutting down uh, and the health kind of checks uh, start failing and there it's gone from traffic. So it's super, super fast. And that's all handled like in real time from, from the console service discovery system and, and traffic the load balancer kind of watching those. So let me start that back up again, just to see that it works the other way around as well. And that takes a little bit longer because I, I think we kind of have to have uh, a couple of succeeding requests before we decide that the node is healthy. But yeah, there it's back. So, uh, so that, that works really well. And we've also designed this system so that if a node stays unhealthy for a while, we actually terminate that in Amazon, which will cause kind of the auto scaling group to provision another, a new node instead of the old failing one. So everything kind of should, we try and make things as, as kind of self healing as, as possible so that we don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to, to fix stuff. Yeah, awesome. So that's close down that one and that one and just clear out this. So that's one demo down. Uh, yeah, another thing is, is this logging visualization. I just thought it'd be fun to, to show this. Uh, and this is, um, I, we, we are huge fans of Elasticsearch in, in Rikstev and Kibana is like the front end you use to kind of query for Elasticsearch. So I thought it'd be just a fun to show this. This is just a way of kind of visualizing the data we get from uh, we get from the traffic load balancer. So this is the kind of the combination of, of kind of how traffic routes or traffic the load balancer kind of routes requests to the backend API servers. So as you can see here, and this is, this is actually live production stuff. This thin blue line is a canary node that just takes a few percent of, of the traffic for this guy. Uh, so yeah, I won't, I will not take credit for kind of designing this. This is just a tweak of this example, uh, example visualization that, that some smart dude at, uh, at Elastic has, has made. But it just shows kind of an example of, of how easy it is to kind of get a, get a nice overview of things when you have good logging. Uh, yeah, and I, I think I was asked to kind of share this, which I can certainly do. Um, how are we doing on questions, uh, Patricia? They seem to be flowing in, so that's good. Yeah, we started getting some, so if you want to answer during this, that's cool. Yeah, I can, are there any uh, that's kind of... Uh, are... um, well, David asked, I see the version of traffic is a little old, 1.7.5. Very observant, David. Uh, yeah, very good. <laughs> from your experience, how easy is it to update traffic in production environment? Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, when we move to the Kubernetes stuff, I'll actually show us uh, upgrading traffic because we're on, I think we're on 175 there as well. And I, I, I just had that idea earlier today that yeah, probably Patricia won't be happy when I'm demoing old, old tech. But, <laughs> but so we'll actually show, show upgrades there. As far as on the VM-based stuff, what we do is basically we, 
we we use Ansible for all of our provisioning. So what we'll do is essentially we'll we'll pull a request in a new version in Ansible and we'll just redeploy that auto scaling group. And and since we have this kind of robust deprovisioning process that that I already talked a little bit about, that that's get, get that gets handled really really nicely. We we generally stay a few versions back. Uh, unless there is like a CVE or some some pressing reason to upgrade, so we won't be the first first to upgrade to a new major version. But we try and kind of stay more or less within uh, within at least a decent decent version. Yeah, but uh, but it's more um, yeah the process itself is is quite pain free actually both for Kubernetes and for Windows uh, and for Wind or uh, or for VM based uh, VM based services. So yeah. Uh, we have another one too. Thank yeah. you. For that. Uh, David, let us know if that didn't answer what you needed, please. Um, and then Ronald, thank you for your question. Do you intend to run any Windows containers, or are you keeping them as VMs and only use Linux containers? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think I think at least we'll we'll experiment with Windows containers. We we try and kind of keep an eye on it. But right now it's it's quite new tech and it's it's quite different to have or from having it kind of work on your laptop to actually run uh, run like heavy heavy amount of, of amount of requests like we do in production against something. And and so far I have to admit that it just just doesn't feel quite rock solid yet. Uh, so our kind of goal for now is to just move as fast as we can into Amazon, basically without changing too much. And then some some of our code base will be re rewritten to .NET Core, which will allow us to put in Kubernetes. And then for the rest, we'll, we'll just see. But it, it's definitely something we, we are keeping an eye on. It just, it just doesn't feel quite production grade just yet. But now with Windows 2019 that was recently released, that, that might have changed. So so yeah, we but we are keeping half an eye on it. Yeah. Half, half an eye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all we can afford. <laughs> so much else else going on. Cool, that's it for now. Do you want to carry on and we'll see what Yeah, yeah. Cool. Happy to. Um, so yeah, that's the end of the kind of non non Kubernetes based session, uh, and um, and I think it's it's worth mentioning that kind of right now the the bulk of our traffic doesn't doesn't go to a, an app running in Kubernetes. It goes to and goes to an app running on on like traditional VMs. But we try and and kind of look to the future as well, which is which is why we. We'll probably spend more time on kind of tweaking our, our Kubernetes-based infrastructure than our VM-based infrastructure. So it's it's definitely a state of kind of ramp up. And and as I write here, for if if a developer kind of writes a completely new app, like a total greenfield service, we'll generally put that in, in Kubernetes. There's a good chance it will be based on .NET Core 2, and then we'll we'll stuff that in Kubernetes. Um, but but we have this this challenge that maybe uh, I don't know if if it's a strange challenge or if it's just something that people generally don't talk about. But we actually cannot expose every single app and service we have to the public internet. We have some internal endpoints that may not have authentication or at least robust authentication. And, and some of our stuff just needs, so we just need that separation between internal and external kind of uh, endpoints. And, and that's something that, that took us a little while to kind of figure out how to do well uh, with Kubernetes. Um, but yeah, I, th I thought I'd just do a Kubernetes primer. It's, it's uh, often you kind of expect everyone to be awesome at Kubernetes, but I think I saw this I think it's it's still like only 10% of of companies are actually doing containers for production so it might might make make sense to to kind of give a little bit of a primer in case anyone in the audience are are not super into kubernetes at least yet but um but basically kubernetes is a container scheduler and kind of the unit of scale in kubernetes is a pod and inside a pod you can have one or multiple containers but that's that's essentially kind of the, the the unit you work with. So typically in a pod, you'll have 
like an app container that may contain like a REST API or whatnot. And then maybe you have some sidecars that do message handling or, no, that's, that's a bad example. But let's say you have a sidecar that does some logging or some kind of supporting, supporting work. If you have a web API, you might have a sidecar that's running Nginx just to kind of proxy requests so you don't have to expose your, your uh, internal kind of service endpoint. But anyway, uh, and then what you do in order to kind of make sure that requests kind of reach your, your endpoint living inside of a container is that you define a service and a service just points to a number of pods that are basically configured the same way, running the same running the same uh, service typically. Um, and then from there you have a choice in kind of how you want traffic to kind of go from the internet and kind of end up inside your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you can use kind of load balancers directly, but you can also use this, uh, this concept, which is called an ingress. And an ingress is basically just a rule. So you can say that this ingress says that like the example to the left here, that foo.mydomain.com should point to this service, which again points to a number of pods. And then this drawing isn't actually completely accurate because an ingress isn't a physical thing, it's just a rule. So what you do is you put an ingress controller that can, uh, that can kind of read that rule set, the list of ingresses, and then actually make traffic flow. And that's where traffic, the load balancer com comes in. So it, in Kubernetes, it works as, as an ingress controller. So it, it looks, as, uh, it looks at, at requests coming in and decides where to kind of send them uh, inside, the, inside the Kubernetes cluster. So that's, that's essentially how, how it works. And, and you have a choice of ingress controllers. The default one is Nginx. But we found that we, we think it's a really good idea to kind of be a little bit standardized. It's traffic, the load balancer is a, is a product we know and love. So, so for us, it kind of made sense to, to use the same uh, in Kubernetes as, as we do for our VM-based infrastructure. And we, we definitely haven't regretted it so far. Awesome. So um, essentially, what what we uh, what we have set up is in in Kubernetes you have this concept of a worker, uh, formerly called a slave, but that's not that's not a that's not a word we use anymore. So we call it a worker. Uh, and and uh, Rixdev, a Kubernetes worker, has four traffic instances, uh, and two of those will handle kind of internal traffic traffic that comes from our internal network and two of them would ha handle external traffic. And then the reason we have two is that we have one for HTTP and then one for HTTPS. So uh, that gives us a really like nice separation between internal and external and also between non-encrypted and encrypted traffic. And here as well, we use Amazon's ALBs to kind of terminate the, the SSL traffic itself and then it gets kind of forwarded to to the Kubernetes worker where the traffic load balancer ingress controller takes care of kind of routing it into each container. Um, so we pub published them by host ports. And then here as well, we have uh, the, the Amazon load balancer kind of aggressively probing for health. So if a Kubernetes worker is unhealthy or, the, or a traffic load balancer uh, instance in it is unhealthy, uh, we don't send any requests to that node. So that also gets picked up really, really quickly and nicely. Um, so yeah, this is just, again, how it, how it kind of works. So there's two, one external and one internal load balancer, and then two, a pair of traffic uh, load balancer nodes for each, for each of them. So that might seem a little bit complex. I actually wrote this Medium blog post about how we've done it like this, and, and there's a link to that in the slide, which we'll share with with everyone later on. So if you want to kind of uh, either read it or blatantly disagree in the comment field, you are very free to do so. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, you kind of end up with a bunch of containers. But again, the traffic load balancer is a really lightweight thing. So it doesn't really hurt us that bad to kind of run a bunch of them. Um, again, things we learn here as well. Uh, Traffic the load balancer has this termination grace period setting, which I briefly touched on uh, earlier. So, so again, it's it's this 
traffic, the load balancer has, has all these functionalities. You just have to kind of design things correctly so that you can safely not only scale up, but scale down and kind of remove capacity as well without that hurting your users. Um, and also when, in terms of deployments and upgrades to traffic itself, we actually use our regular kind of continuous deployment pipeline to, to deploy updates. Um, and I can probably show that in a few, in a few minutes. Um, so first one is, I haven't touched much on this, but traffic, the load balancer has this awesome integration with different open tracing providers. And that's actually something we've grown very, very fond of. So I thought it'd be, it'd be fun to just show that. Um, so I don't know how many of you have, have kind of looked at, at open tracing, but what it essentially does, it, it, it gives you more visibility into how your application is working. So instead of just a log statement showing that, hey, this request took 500 milliseconds, tracing kind of allows you to kind of step into the and kind of understand why, what component was slow and which component fails. So you get more detail than you typically get from just logging. Um, and if you just flip that switch in, in the traffic load balancer and enable logging and, and have set up the Jaeger infrastructure, Jaeger is a open tracing implementation from, from the awesome guys at Uber. So this is basically what you get. So you can get each request to kind of, uh, so you get to know which, uh, which uh, node it, it arrived at and how long it take and the status code and things like that. So if you don't do anything inside of your application, this is what you, this is what you get. So you can search for, for example, for requests that took longer than a, than a second or you can filter for failed requests, stuff like that. Um, but if you, in addition to that, kind of take the time to, to drop in some, some tracing statements inside your application as well, it'll look like this. Um, so as you can see here, these kind of, this is a request that kind of came in through traffic uh, into our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and these upper three ones are actually how traffic the load balancer handled it. And then these yellow ones are inside of a Python app. And then the app again makes an outbound call which also gets handled by, by the traffic load balancer. So this is kind of like another trace. Uh, and, and we, for, for our more critical apps, apps we, we actually spend a, a fair bit of time to kind of get the tracing right because it's, it provides a lot of info, much, much more than, than what just straight up access logging does. So it's definitely worth checking out. And also in the show notes, there is a link to this. I wrote this little mini article uh, about kind of just getting a really nice and small demo set up with a simple flask app and traffic the load balancer. So if you are interested, uh, you sh everything should be in that GitHub repo for you to kind of play with it and kind of see how, see how it works and if it's interesting to you. So yeah, so traffic and uh, Jaeger is, is really awesome together. Um, yeah, and, and again, as, as far as dev responsibility when it comes to our Kubernetes infrastructure, we, we have abstracted away all of the kind of Kubernetes nitty gritty into this container deployment library. Um, Kubernetes kind of manifests as they're called can be quite complex and it's, it's not something we kind of want our devs to be exposed to. We want them to write awesome services and not having to deal with, with uh, all of the kind of nitty gritty uh, communities object details. So, so dev simply sets like a couple of uh, variables like host names and do you want this to be an internal or external endpoint? Uh, what's the Docker container image that you are building? And then basically this deployment library handles the rest. Um, so I have some config details to share there as well. Um, Patricia, feel free to kind of interrupt me if you, if there's a like really timely question that we should deal with right away. All right, cool. I think we're good now. Everyone, please feel free to answer. This is the time. Thanks. Yeah. Right, for yeah. Ask questions. yeah. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to show quickly our, um, the, this is like the traffic load balancer configuration file for those uh, containers that, that run in Kubernetes, the ingress controller. 
And again, I just want to point out these uh, timeout settings inside of traffic, the load balancer, which are, as I, as I keep repeating, so critical to get right because they, they make sure that you don't fail requests when you kind of are in a state of transition in your cluster. Um, and I think I also have a, uh, a YAML. Where's the YAML? Maybe I don't have the YAML. No, it's not that. Oh, well, bygones. Um, and, and yeah, also here's kind of the tracing setup. As you can see, we've, we've kind of just inject that into variables so that when, when the container comes up, it starts kind of sending these requests trace, traces to our, to our Jaeger infrastructure. Yes, Patricia, was there a question or? Uh, there is no question, um, not yet, sorry. Okay. Wait, keep going. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so there was a question about upgrading traffic earlier, and I thought I, I'd since since like I said, we are on on like a outdated version in our Kubernetes cluster as well. I thought it'd be timely to do that uh, to do that together today, so we can share the blame if it goes wrong. Um, let's see. So here, here. Let me just open that. Uh, so this is we use this deploy uh, deploy system called called Octopus Deploy, which was really made for kind of deploying .NET based apps, which is probably why we have it for historical reasons. But you can basically do anything in it, so there's nothing stopping you from deploying awesome traffic load balancer updates to a Kubernetes cluster in in it as well. And this this is a pull request build that I've built, which which contains an update to to kind of the latest version of of traffic. So I thought I'd just deploy that to dev. That should be good, right? Uh, and then we need to have a look at what's going on. Mm. And I think I put that in a, yeah, here we are. So this is my dev cluster, so nothing, nothing dangerous going on. Uh, but as you can see, uh, we are now currently at four workers in our dev cluster. Uh, so what's 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 going to happen happen now? That is for each node, we'll kind of terminate the the four traffic instances, bring them back up, and then we'll wait for a minute, I think, just for everything to stabilize, and then we'll move on. So this process will actually take a bit of time because we just do it really nicely and slowly. Um, but as you can see, it it's it's gone its way, and then uh, in I don't know five, six, seven minutes, everything should be up and running and, and there's a good chance we didn't miss a single single incoming request while this was updating based on that kind of aggressive health probing from the Amazon load balancer and those kind of termination and grace time settings that we've set inside the traffic load balancer, load balancer itself. So, so that's a fairly robust process and, and we're, not, we're not afraid to do the same in, in production like during, during daytime. We, we fully trust the process to kind of be robust enough for us to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be able to do that during daytime. So we don't usually like get up at three in the morning to do this. We just push deploy and assume that it'll work and it, and it does. Uh, as long as I don't fat finger any config files. So that's another story. So yeah, I'll just let that let that run, and we'll see what see what happens. Uh, and then uh, yeah, there was I think there was some more demos here that we can do. Uh, I think I had some more files here. Yeah, so I, I thought I'd show off just how kind of traffic kind of reacts when when there is a when there is a pod failure or a change kind of in in the layout of the of the containers that that it kind of sends traffic to. So what we can do is that we can let's find a new one and see if the see if the UI is nice now. So this one no. This one is a new one. So I'll just, uh, so 
what I'm doing now is basically I'm just setting up a bridge so that I can kind of get to the get to the nice dashboard of the traffic load balancer instance. So if I do this now and then go here and do localhost 8080. Does it work or have I crushed my... Uh... I hear this, good. Uh, oh, what's it called? My... Oh, here it is. So this is just a demo app. And as you can see in here, it, it, it looks very much like, like the VM based one, but here we're not talking about VMs that we send traffic to. These are two kind of container instances that we, that we route traffic to. Um, so everything that kind of comes into this ingress gets a uh, load balanced between these two. So I thought I could just quickly show how a failure would look just just for the sake of it. I hope, hopefully that's not too small for you. Um, so what I can do is, let's see. Whoa, that's not right at all. I outsmarted myself and I don't grep to kubectl either. Okay, good. So, so this is uh, this is an an app that's right now it's scaled to two pods, as you can see. It has a desired count of two. Um, so, what what we can do is we can kind of break one of them just to see how quick, quickly the the traffic load balancer uh, kind of picks that up. So, if I do get pods and grab to that name, I should see two, and then I'll just kill off one of them. Delete pod. And as you can see, that's quite quite instantly that as well. So what Kubernetes does now is that it sees that, hey, I'm supposed to run two instances of this container, but I only have one, so I'll go and spin up a new one. So in a few seconds, um, there, will, there will be a new one coming up. It's actually already up. So there, I already got a new one. So that's just how Kubernetes works, that it, it always, always tries to kind of maintain this desired state that that you've that you've described for it, and then it just attempts as as best it can to to maintain that. Yeah, so so that's that's Kubernetes and traffic. We are really happy that we that we chose the traffic load balancer also for kind of running our Kubernetes stuff. It, it's really it's really a pleasant product to work with. So I can wholeheartedly uh, recommend that. I'm coming coming back on on in just. Yeah. Say um, thanks for that compliment. We love uh, you and Tr and Rick's TV using us. Um, did you have more demos to show, or should we uh, kind of? No, what I what I did, I added like a bonus one in case in case I would have not spent enough time. Um, but I, I definitely got. I was able to kind of get through what I what I planned to get through. Uh, so at, I guess timing wise, we are pretty much where we should be, aren't we? We are. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I'm tempted to, you know, if we were in a concert to give, to see what your, what your last uh, demo is, if you want to show it real quick, I think. Um, I, can, I, can, I can talk a little bit about it at least. And then we, it doesn't have to be more than, than one or two minutes uh, of time spent on it. But. Uh, but what we've been looking into lately is, as I as I've described for you all, we 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 now have this kind of this VM-based estate and then these Kubernetes-based estate, and they they kind of live quite isolated lives. They they have completely different set of external load balancers, and there's not much kind of shared uh, between them, and that kind of that causes some. Uh, some challenges that we'll probably hit, hit later on where we kind of have to take some kind of some paths from from a host name and route it to, to Kubernetes while some other paths are routed into our kind of legacy Windows-based infrastructure. So what we've worked on uh, a little bit lately is if we are able to kind of make this uh, make this work in a, in a more hybrid world uh, and and um, yeah, I certainly have 
there is a demo there, but it, it's not really super, super awesome. It's not something super interesting. But what we actually do is that we, we can set this tag on the ingress object in Kubernetes, which will make it kind of register, its, register itself in console, which then again causes the traffic load balancer that watches console to start sending some of that traffic into Kubernetes. So it's kind of running traffic behind traffic in a way. But, but that should allow us to kind of bridge that gap a little bit. But it, it's still early days. But in, in my presentation link at the, at the end, there is, there is a link to a Medium blog post that I wrote a little bit about that as well. So I don't think I'll, yeah, the demo isn't really worth sharing because it doesn't look that good. So I, I think I'll stop there actually. Well, if you're cool, I see that um, Jakob uh, Kofal, who's actually a friend of the family at, at Traffic, has a question. Um, okay, yeah, go for it. Cool. Where do you see benefits and downsides in running Traffic as a daemon set instead of deployment? Uh, so a daemon set, uh, with a daemon set, you have more control over, uh, over if let's say you have some agent that you want to make sure that is run on every worker in your Kubernetes uh, infrastructure, uh, you typically use a daemon set there. You can kind of set stricter guarantees around around the fact that, or you can yeah, you can guarantee that every worker kind of gets one instance of of some function, and uh, or some container, and and that works really well for traffic. But but you can do. Uh, you can do all kinds of things in bigger clusters. You could, for example, set aside parts of the cluster to kind of be the network edge, and then you could just run the traffic load balancer on those nodes, so you don't have to run run that set on every node. And it's just it's Kubernetes is a super flexible thing, and and you can kind of do pretty much whatever you want. But for us, uh, it just felt simpler to run them as daemon sets. So we know that each kind of worker node is, is uh, essentially identical in terms of the traffic load balancer stuff. So it just felt, felt neater. But I'm sure, I'm sure there are people running it as, as deployments as, as well and have a good success with that. I wouldn't be surprised. Cool. Uh, he has one more, a follow-up. Do you load balance in node only or overall workers? So we have uh, we have basically um, uh, kind of the edge load balancer for us is is a set of Amazon load balancers and they will load balance between whatever number of workers we happen to be running uh, and that's all kind of flat so so if there's four workers they I, we haven't measured it but I would guess that each of them take close to twenty five percent twenty five percent of the load. So it's uh, so it's it's kind of a double hop in there as well, but that that's just how ingress controllers work. Um, but that that's been working well enough for us. I would I would probably assume that we kind of get into some growing pains later as we kind of put more and more stuff inside of Kubernetes. But but so far that's been working really really well. Splendid. Sounds good. Um, yeah. If there's no more questions, I think we should uh, gear towards wrapping up if you're cool with that, Trond. Yeah, I am. I can just maybe just zoom f uh, or just fast forward to the... So as I s this this slide set will will be shared with you so you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to like jot down these URLs. It's just a link of, of URLs that kind of touch on some of the, some of the points I, I briefly mentioned during the presentation. And then, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, that was beautiful. I, I can hear everyone who is jo who has joined us clapping silently. Uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> thank you so much. And as Tron mentioned, we will be providing um, this deck, and we'll put the questions asked um, to the best of our ability on a GitHub gist. Um, as we wrap up, a few things. One is I really encourage all of you to reach out to me with any feedback or comments or uh, thoughts to uh, collaborate. Um, I also want to invite you to upcoming meetups, which will include uh, a talk by Rookout, Holiday Check, Rocket Chat, and um, a, a friend of Traffics in Germany, Manuel Zapp. Um, and those will be uh, shared 
via a monthly um, notification. So if you haven't signed up yet to receive this monthly notification, I have put the link in the chat box and I will create a little very simple um, notifier to let you what, know what's cool with traffic that's happening so you can join us. Also, we have a really cool thing happening uh, starting next week, which is about Traffic Enterprise Edition, um, which has a free early access available to you now. And that will be a brief uh, talk by, or demo by uh, Damian, our developer advocate, developer Avocado, and Adrian of our, our team, a sales engineer, sales manager. And he, they will be sharing the features that Traffic Enterprise Edition offers. Um, and we'd like you to join us if you're interested. And the link to register for that is also in the chat box. So uh, if you didn't capture all of that, ping me. And if you'd like to get in touch with Trond on Twitter, he is at Trond Hindenis and um, send him an, a clap emoji. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. We adore you and are stoked that you could join us and hope you'll join us for future ones. And Trond, we can't thank you enough uh, for everything. So thank you. My absolute pleasure, Patricia. Cool. Well, and scene, we will wrap this now. Thank you, everyone. See ya.